because today we have a very special guest, my good friend, Rajul. Now, Rajul is a serial entrepreneur. He has founded many companies. Not only has he founded many companies, but two of the companies he founded went on to become unicorn status. He currently is an angel investor with his, his VC fund called Leo Capital. He has invested in multiple, multiple startups. Now, Raju has an incredible, credible story, and there are many lessons that we can personally learn out from it. So not only is Raju a serial entrepreneur, but he's a very humble guy, nice guy, and we're going to learn who Raju is. So Raju, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. I'm excited to be here, uh, and I look forward to the conversation. Perfect. Thank you. So Raju, let's jump right into it. You know, before everything began, before, before Pine Labs, before Global Logic, before Sunstone, before everything, where are you from and what was your upbringing like? So uh, I'm from the northern part of India, uh, and there is a state just, uh, I would say, just, uh, just close to Delhi called UP, Uttar Pradesh. Uh, and, and my dad was in a government job, so we kept on getting transferred while I was growing up all through different parts of UP. Um, so life was simple, you know, it was about sort of playing cricket after school, going to school, studying hard. Um, you know, government, government colonies are sort of very, you know, everybody's like everybody, everyone else. I mean, there's not much diversity. Um, you know, so it was simple. And then I, I went to IIT Delhi, uh, which is sort of the big engineering school in Delhi. And I think since then, um, so that is 94, 94 to 98, I did my engineering. And that's sort of what brought me to the big bad world of sort of engineering and computer science and ultimately entrepreneurship in Delhi. Uh, and since then, I've been a resident of Delhi, except for a few stints in the U.S. Uh, here and now. So, wow. so, that's a little bit. so a kid growing up in the north of India, where did your passion for entrepreneurship come from as a child or from going forward? <laughs> You know, it's a tough one. I, I don't I don't really know because I think in our sort of, um, I mean, see, if you go back, like my grandfather or great-grandfather, they used to be entrepreneurs, you know, like small time. They used to run small time shops and things like that. But honestly, it wasn't really an influence on me uh, because we have never lived together and I didn't really see that much of them. Uh, and in our family, everything was about a government job uh, back in the 80s or sort of or going to the U.S., for further studies, that's what my brother did. He came to he came to the U.S. for his master's, uh, and he he lives here in New York and works at the Wall Street. So I think uh, I think it was more um, I would say later on while I was doing my engineering, uh, I think the first time I really heard of it was that my roommate's uncle was an entrepreneur. So when I was in my sort of uh, sophomore year uh, in my engineering, then sort of I met his uncle and I was inspired by him. And that was my first real exposure to a modern form of entrepreneurship where there's sort of technology and funding and scale and all that kind of stuff. Uh, before that, was it meant more like shops, small shops to me, uh, and it wasn't very attractive. Right. You know, India is a very risk-averse country. And for you to start a, a startup in 1998, right after college, is unheard of. Um, you know, from all the entrepreneurs I spoke to and from what I know so far about India, I think you're one of the first ones that I know that actually started a startup back in 1998, to, at least until 2010 when the whole ecosystem blew up right after college. So right. first of all, I'm not, I'm not even going to ask what your parents were probably thinking, you know, they, um, but so growing up with a risk adverse person, um, you know, whole mentality is about risk averse. How did you go about to get the guts to even go about and build it? Say, hey, you know what? I'm not going to go to the traditional route. I'm not going to work for one of the big other companies. I'm not going to go to get a government job. I'm going to go and take my own journey. Um, yeah, you know, I think I have to say that the IIT system in India particularly is, um, is very enabling and it really fills you with confidence. Uh, and even more so, I think back in the 90s and even now, I think, I think you're treated like gods you know, you, you believe that you really, you could get jobs easily and sort of everyone wants you, seems to want you. Uh, and I think that itself becomes a big confidence booster. So even today, I see a lot of kids coming out of top colleges and doing entrepreneurship. And I think it's somewhat easier if you're coming out from a top college because it's just so good for your own confidence. Uh, you know, you feel confident that if, if it fails, you'll get some other job. 
and it's not the end of the world, particularly in India. Um, so I think that was definitely a part of it. Look, now when I look back, honestly, it wasn't, um, I wish I could tell you a better story, but there was no real grand vision or sort of, um, uh, sort of really uh, very a thought through decision uh, and all that. I think, I think it was more a case of one thing led to another. I think there was motive. I, I did sort of, uh, I was inspired, like I told you, from my roommate's uncle. Uh, I, think, uh, I think the salaries in India were really low at that time. I think they have gone up significantly. So when I graduated, I think the best salaries from our college were like four or $5,000 a year. And I thought, look, how bad can I do? Well, I'll sort of figure out a way to make this much. Uh, you know, I was, I was dating. I didn't really want to go to the U.S. at the time. Uh, and you know, this, all these things put together, I, I did get, get an opportunity with sort of somebody I knew they wanted to get some software done so I could see something immediately to do. Uh, and I think, so all these things really came together. I know, I know the big decision for me, uh, was that I, I got a job offer from this consulting firm in the U S called Deloitte and Touche DNT here in Parsippany, New Jersey, uh, for $48,000. And I think that was a big decision for me to take it or not to take it. But once I decided not to take that. It was easy, and I, I think it was a combination of all those little things versus sort of, um, you know, like I said, I wish I could tell you that I was a big visionary, but I really don't think that would be honest. <laughs> well, you definitely had some type of vision because Pine Labs, which is your first company you founded right after college, is a unicorn status. It has a billion-dollar valuation. Um, so let's talk about that first, your first startup. So you come out of college. You had this idea to create a POS system for stores. I'm not sure if that was the original idea. Um, which happens to be right now the biggest one in India too. And it goes on to a billion dollar valuation. Just simple. Right. Yeah. Now, tell us about the early challenges of your first startup without having any experience in anything in entrepreneurship and startups in building a company at all. Sure. Look, I think firstly, I want to say that many, many young entrepreneurs these days, they, they think of it this way that sort of you start a company and bang, it's like, you know, it becomes a billion dollar company. I just want to say that in case of Pine Labs, that bank was a 20 year bank, yeah. you know, so it was started in 98 and bang, 20 year later, it becomes a billion dollar company. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So I think, I think it's, a, it's, it's been sort of incremental hard work uh, from a lot of people and sort of gradual growth over years that Pine Labs has seen. Uh, but, uh, but very proud of the company, not just because it's, uh, it's large and billion dollars, but if you're in India, you see it everywhere. You know, you go to a restaurant in Delhi and, you know, my kids embarrassingly always point out our dad invented it and you, know, and you see it everywhere. You can't miss it. Like if you're, if you're in India, in any of the metros these, uh, these days, so just very, very proud. And I wrote the software basically more than anything else uh, for that company. But, um, you know, the way it started was uh, when I graduated, um, you know, uh, a company, point of sales was still new to India. Uh, and, you know, they used to have those, uh, like those machines, which are kitsch catch machine, right? It's like a, card machine, you use an imprint and sort of yep, somebody used to make a call and take a credit card approval. So point of sales was still coming to India. I think um, I, I had a friend, uh, you know, who wanted to get software for point of sales in India, uh, compliant with the Indian conditions. And, uh, uh, you know, they wanted to sell that hardware in India, but they needed the software. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so I got plugged in into that and sort of uh, wrote the software the first couple of years. Um, it, it was a slow, slow journey. I mean, I, you know, I, I think at many points, the company was always very promising, but always growing very slowly for some reason. And I think uh, all of us expected it to become much bigger 10 years earlier, five years earlier. Uh, but finally, I think uh, it, it took a long time because the ecosystem matured and everything else fell into place. Uh, but in any case, so I, I actually wrote the software, ran the company the first five years. Uh, then I hired the CEO, um, you know, Loquid, who was the CEO until uh, beginning of last year. So he sort of was running it for the last 15 years. I was on the board for another five uh, and I fully exited, I think in 2009 uh, or so to Sequoia, Sequoia in India. Uh, so Sequoia India came in and sort of put in a lot of money and grew it along with the new management team over the last 10 years. Uh, and uh, I think the big switch, I think the company has sort of pivoted from a pure software company to a more solutions company, to a payment company, to sort of a payment network you know, over a period of time. And I think, uh, I think this last pivot, which the company did over the last five years has seen it sort of really uh, become huge. Uh, and now, in fact, it's pivoting to like a square in the US to other stuff like lending and all kinds of stuff as well. So I think it has a bright future ahead of it. Uh, but, you know, like all, all sort of, um, all journeys, I think that I've seen, I think it's been sort of gradual incremental improvement 
year after year, uh, slower than you would have thought. Uh, but I think it's just the power of persistence and, you know, 10% improvement every year and it gets you there. I think that's what, that's going to be the pilot story. Right. Yeah. You know, especially of our generation, you know, millennials, generation Y, generation X, you know, we hear, for example, the Amazon story, Amazon, a trillion dollar company. Mm-hmm. Amazon's been around for 20 years, 21 years. And it took from 1998, whenever it started before and seven till now to build out the whole entire thing. You know, it didn't happen overnight. And the same thing over here, like I love, sorry, I love how you mentioned that. You know, we want immediate gratification. We want it now. We have no time to wait 20 years. But it, in truth, that's how it is. A startup is not built overnight. It goes 20-year journey. And you can see from your own testament of what you've said currently. That's amazing. Okay. Exactly. And, but I think the fun part is I think you, you get to know as you hit product market fit, you get to see the success that it's growing every year. It's going in the right direction. I think if, if you can hit that stride, I think then, you know, it becomes more of a time and space problem, right? That you just kind of keep spending more time and you will get there. But, but patience, persistence are still extremely important. I think qualities and characteristics of a successful entrepreneur. Right. So from Prime Labs, you know, you're there for a few years and then all of a sudden you, you're like, you know what? You got the entrepreneurial bug again. You're like, you know, this is getting you know, a little bit the routine. I want some change in my life. And <laughs> go ahead and you form another company called Global Logic. All right. So I think uh, uh, Pine Labs was uh, a very small at that point. So in the first five years, it hadn't really gone to any significant scale. It was about half a million dollars in revenue. So it was still relatively small. Uh, and this is the time when, when we hired, uh, when I hired uh, the CEO, uh, Lokri, and that created an opportunity for me to do something else. Um, so that's how Global Logic happened. I think, uh, you know, I thought at that point, it didn't feel like that Pine Labs was, is going to get that big that soon. Uh, and I feel it had the right leadership and, um, you know, we got excited about, uh, you know, totally something else. Uh, you know, Mary Meeker had come up with a report in 2001 around sort of how B2B was going crazy. Uh, and, you know, her, her, her internet report has obviously become like a legend over years, but she was still new at that time. And, you know, she was still writing really well. Uh, and, uh, you know, so we got our hands on that report and some of us got together and started thinking of what eventually became Global Logic. But again, sort of very, um, the journey was definitely not linear by any stretch. You know, the uh, Pine Labs actually pivoted from being uh, more of a services company to a product company over a period of time. Global Logic actually pivoted from being a global, uh, from product company to a service company. So mm-hmm. we started as more B2B products, uh, you know, inspired totally by Mary Meeker's 2001 report, uh, and then sort of suffered through the 2002, 2003 crisis. Uh, and, you know, then sort of got into it, uh, gone to services to keep the lights on initially, and then sort of grew and grew. Uh, but, but Global Logic for me was a far more, um, sort of, it was a very satisfying journey because I was, it grew very fast, uh, you know, in those years uh, from 2002 until I left it, I think, uh, towards end of 2009, 2010. Uh, and uh, it grew fast. It was, uh, we saw a lot of success. Uh, I was very much sort of part of that team. Uh, which was sort of uh, uh, driving it. Um, so I think, uh, so I think, you know, so that's how it happened. Uh, again, sort of, I had other co-founders in Global Logic. I had three other co-founders. Uh, so it sort of happenstance put us together. Two of them were in the U.S. And that's also how my U.S. connection started. So one of them had sort of, it was also an IIT grad. He had come to India looking for a co-founder with literally the Mary Meeker report in his hand. Uh, you know, so I think uh, that's, how, uh, that's how it started. And again, sort of things led, uh, you know, one thing led to the other, find that created an opportunity and sort of global logic grew and grew. Right. Wow. So I'm going to go back to Pine Logic for a second, Pine Labs for a second. Right. And you mentioned the first five years, the growth was very, um, you know, very slow, very stagnant. Yep. So how did you keep yourself motivated to come on a daily basis back to work? You know, you're trying to build this whole startup and you're keeping at the same level of revenue for a few years. The growth is going slow. Um, you know, so not only how do you keep yourself motivated, what was that continuous push just to keep forward, keep forward, like as if something will happen eventually? What was it? Look, I think that's a really good question. And that's a tough one. I, I remember in 2001, particularly, um, you know, it was a really bad year. And I, I remember that 9-11 happened. Uh, you know, f- there was just no funding available of any kind. Uh, business was completely dried up. Uh, I remember sort of this is the first time I had to lay off people, right? So sort of laid off half the people in our office, cut salaries, this and that. So I think, um, I think that was in some ways like a transformational year for me, like 2001. I think uh, 
and I'll always remember it because of 9-11 as well. And it all happened around that time, you know, like from August until October, November. Um, so I think I think the word, the global mood was reflective of my mood. Uh, yeah. But I think um, I think one thing that worked for me, I feel, was I was just young and naive. You know, like I was, you know, I was 98 graduate, so I was like 23, 24 at the time. And, um, you know, I wasn't, I hadn't really invested a lot of my career or time or money. Uh, the cost of failure was low. You know, I was still sort of more experimental in my head. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, never really took myself very seriously. Uh, you know, so, I, you know, I think my opportunity costs were like, like totally $5,000 a year uh, in India. So when I put it all together, it didn't feel like, um, you know, that was like a big deal. Uh, and I was having enough fun. Like I was working with really good people. Uh, I think that was the one part that I think I did well, I think right from day one. And I've been fairly lucky in that regard all through my career uh, to be able to find really good people to work with. Uh, and that was the case with Pine Labs and then later on Global Logic as well, uh, where I think the team just immediately around me was very supportive, really high quality, committed to high quality work, you know, had the maturity uh, to deal with ups and downs. And I think that more than anything else, uh, you know, kept me going and kept me together. So I, I, I've had very few moments truly of self-doubt I don't know what that is, I think, and why that is. And I, I have a friend told me, tell me that that's kind of not completely normal. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but but I, I think that's that's who I am. And I've realized over a period of time that I'm, and sometimes I'm blamed for that, actually, that I'm too unemotional and too unperturbed by things around me. Like if you ask my wife, she'll say, okay, like you have to show more emotion, for example. <laughs> but, um, but I'm truly sort of, um, um, you know, sort of, you know, it is what it is kind of a person, right? So I think uh, that sort of things are being served out to us. And right. in some ways, I believe our job is to do the best we can under any circumstance. Right. You know? and, I mean, listen, you've accomplished a feat that not many people have accomplished. I mean, I only know maybe on my hands, three people um, that I could count that have created, started two companies that have become unicorn status. You know, I know Steve Jobs with Pixar and Apple. You have Jack from Twitter and Square. And then you have Ra Rajul from Hit It's It. I don't know anyone else. I mean, that's an, a, a feat that is not a simple feat to accomplish. That's amazing. I think it's, a, I think it's an unfair comparison, though. I think it's a Haiti. I think these, these guys are way, 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 way bigger. I think, and also, the other difference is that uh, Pine Labs, I mean, when I left, it was still small. It was not 8 to It was still sort of, it was nowhere close to being a unicorn. Uh, Global Logic, I would say, I took it further uh, down the line. It was almost a unicorn by the time I left. Uh, but I think, um, uh, you know, I'm, I don't want to say, I think I can't take these things too seriously, to be honest with you. I think, I think these things happen, you know, and they might as well have not happened, uh, you know, and I think they just happened at the time and, you know, people, teams, markets allowed it to happen. And I'm very fortunate uh, to being a part of those teams. Right. So with that journey, you know, what are the lessons that you personally learned for yourself along the way? You know, you come from a 1998 graduate, you have no skills in management, no skills in building a team, no nothing. And then you go on to build the two companies and all that. So what lessons have you, did you need to learn? Um, and what do you find in the most important things for yourself along that whole journey? I think uh, one thing which has been reinforced um, time and again for me, I think in my labs, Global Logic, as an investor now uh, and all that, I think just working with people sort of that you like uh, and sort of high quality people, ideally who are smarter than you and sort of, I think it's an old adage and I think it's a cliche at this point of time, but um, you know, like many other cliches, it's true. Um, so I think if you can find people who, uh, who you like working with, and they're smart and have their heart in the right place and have the right sort of drive and all that, I think just everything becomes so much easier. So I think that's probably the number one thing. And I, I think, like I said, I think it was probably a little bit lucky to start with, but I recognized it. Uh, and I think over a period of time, just cultivated it more and more. Uh, and that's what I think entrepreneurs today, I would tell them that I think, I think finding the right people to work with you and, and the definition of right is very personal, uh, you know, to the business and it's contextual to the business. It's personal to a person. Uh, you know, but I think, uh, I think answering that and figuring that out is a big one. Uh, I think for, uh, for anyone, it was a big one for me. Um, I think, uh, after that, I would say over a period of time, I sort of became, uh, you know, I think good at sort of understanding key business metrics. Uh, you know, I think I, I didn't start out that way, but I think just because again, global logic particularly was a very ops driven business. We had like a thousand people and I, I spent my formative years from like, 
first five years just after Pine Labs, building global logic where everything was about hiring and managing, right? So we, I, I was the CEO, chief operating officer. So grew the team to a thousand people before sort of I, I, I moved into M&A and corporate development. So I think those five years of sort of hiring and sort of working with people, I think just developed a lot of bandwidth. Like I had, I had pretty broad shoulders even today. Like people are surprised how quick I am to respond to emails and how good I am with calendar and things like that. And I think, I think my journey necessitated that. At that time, like I remember I used to come to office and I used to have like 10 half an hour meetings, uh, you know, or 15 half an hour meetings through the day, just one after the other and one would finish and the next one would be standing outside. Uh, and I think that discipline was really good for me. Uh, sort of the discipline of running the trains on time, constantly the consistency, the discipline that you need uh, in any organization. Um, so I think that was, uh, so I think discipline is my second big learning. Just disciplined thought, disciplined execution. If you've read that book, great, uh, good to great. Um, you know, I think I, I, I'm i just, that's a book totally after my own heart uh, of just disciplined thought and disciplined execution and consistency, you know, day in, day out. Um, so those were the two big ones for me. I think, uh, you know, things change uh, sort of uh, outside of you, macro environment changes, a lot of other things change. But I think if you can keep hanging out with the right, right people and keep executing with discipline, things usually fall into place. I think they called that something else. They called people like you um, Superman, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's unfair. I think... Uh, you know, the consistency and discipline having, you know, 15 and a half an hour meetings one after another, that's a... You know, there's a lot of emotional, uh, you know, burnout inside that, you know, it just gets draining. And the fact it, that it is draining, I mean, but I, and I did feel drained out, uh, you know, in five, six years, but I also remember I was young and sort of, you know, a lot of full of energy and uh, a lot of good stuff was happening around us, but it did even for me, I mean, it did burn me out in four or five years and hence the switch to um, sort of M and A, which was, which ultimately took me to the investment world that I'm in today. Uh, but uh, but I, I think at some it's like military training, right? I mean, you got to do it at some point of time. Yeah. I think you know, um, and it just builds those muscles which otherwise would never get built. You know, one of the biggest things about entrepreneurs is they hate doing tedious, small, detailed tasks. That there's no, um, you can't see not the results, but there's nothing to it. You know, just small tedious, like filing a tax return or something like that. It's just a pain. Um, and, you know, to keep it, like you said, it's such an important thing, the discipline to do those things for the five years that you did it, to train your mind to it. That's what keeps an entrepreneur successful or makes a successful company. You know? I, I, somebody's got to do it, right? Those are really important things too, right? I mean, how much strategy or sort of cool work can you do? Even if you're really, I mean, you gave an example of Amazon, right? Amazon is basically, you know, full of hundreds of thousands of ants, literally, right? I mean, your packages are getting delivered from warehouses to you. I mean, you know, the whole sexy consumer front end is a very small piece of Amazon. It's a logistics right. business. So, I mean, you look under the cover anywhere, right? I think it's, it's the ants who do the real work ultimately, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. uh, so I, I agree with you. Yeah. So you mentioned before you never had a moment of self-doubt. Not, not we, never. I've had fewer moments of self-doubt, I would okay. say, uh, sort of uh, being able to sort of deal with them better, I think. Yeah. So tell me, through your time as an entrepreneur so far, you know, in creating your companies, Talk to me about a dark period in the sense that you thought, forget about it, all hell's breaking loose, we're shutting down, or a time that you couldn't get up in the morning because you had a founder burnout. Talk me through that time, that process, and you know how you overcame that. Sure, sure. I think there were two distinctive that I can remember, uh, which were the bigger ones, and then there were smaller ones, I'm sure, galore. Um, you know, every few months, something would happen, sort of, and all that. I think one was definitely 2001, uh, like I was telling you that period around 9-11 and sort of um, nothing was working out for us. I mean, you know, we had very little revenue, very little cash left. Um, you know, we had to lay off people. There was no funding. Um, you know, so I think that was definitely, uh, I remember, in fact, if I, I was just talking to my wife the other day and she said that she remembered me crying. She remembers me crying, though I don't remember it. Uh, you know, but I'm sure, uh, you know, I'm sure it was true because she remembers these things better than, uh, better than I do. Uh, but, uh, so I think that was a tough, tough period. And I think, uh, what has happened, I think what I think tend to do in these things, uh, and I, you know, even when I face, face them personally later in life and all that is to let the process take over instead of thinking too much of the outcome and all that. So the process was to basically cut cost, hunker down, uh, you know, just sort of focus on the customers that you have. Uh, try to sort of scamper through, just survive, uh, you know, get as much cash as you can from wherever you can, uh, you know, be graceful about it, you know, understand that these things happen. So I think that was kind of the one sort of one big, I would say that I clearly, clearly remember 
early on in my life, and which is also a big lesson because still, I was still, like I said, only 24, right? So I think I remember those lessons clearly and sort of, uh, I think they've helped me uh, throughout my life. Um, I think the second one was more around actually much later in life when I did Sunstone. Um, you know, so this was after Global Logic. Uh, you know, I'd seen a decent amount of success, and I had this. Um, you know, I mean, I had I've had two unicorns at that point, and they were not both unicorns at the time, but they were both pretty successful. Uh, and um, you know, so for a brief period of time, I thought I could do no wrong, and I should sort of really, you know, I'm I'm here now, and I will sort of fix the education problem. Uh, you know, just waiting for me to get fixed. Um, and very very humbling experience as I sort of started Sunstone and we started with an online product and it was just poorly conceived, poorly executed. Uh, you know, the market sort of basically taught us that, you know, how, how, how bad we were executing and how wrong we were over the first couple of years. And it is very humbling, very humbling because now I had more expectations for myself, right? When I was kind of earlier, I didn't have any in Pine Labs time, right? But now I had more expectations for myself. Um, so that is a pretty uh, dark period as well in that sense for different reasons. I think even though I had much less financially at stake, uh, but I think it was just humbling because of where I was coming from. And I, I realized that sort of, you know, it's like baseball or cricket in India, right? I mean, however good you are, every time you get on the pitch, it's a new thing, right? It's a new innings. And you got to, you know, go in with humility, watch the ball, work hard, build in innings, and then start hitting, right? And I think that was a lesson that I, I, I totally learned. And a lesson that I've, and I think I took time then to learn India, uh, relearn India, what was happening. And it's so fast changing also, right? That sort of the whole sort of consumer markets keep evolving. Uh, and I think I took the time to relearn it. And I'm, I've been able to apply a lot of those learnings to sort of the investments that I've made. Uh, you know, and have had a very positive uh, sort of, those are the two I distinctly remember. Wow. Now, I love the, the, third, the second part you mentioned, the fact that, you know, you had these two successes already and you figured like, you know what? I am almost, not, I'm not God, but I'm, I'm close enough, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and you go ahead and you, you have the whole opportunity around, around you, everything. You know, you have a recognized name, you have the, the cash to do something. Yeah. And you know what? I can do no wrong. Yeah. And they had the humility, humility lesson and they had that shock. It's just so important, you know, to keep us ground, to keep people grounded, you know? To know that at the end of the day, we're all human. We're all irrational. We're all stupid. We're all subjective, emotional, and everything like that. And to have that thing is just so important. To have that lesson, it's incredible. To, you know, for you to mention that. You know? and, and you know, a lot of things are beyond you, right? I mean, a lot of problems are not really. You can't solve them just by working hard. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. like so in entrepreneurship, that whole product market fit is is an indeterminate problem in many right. ways, right? I mean, it's not. You can't say that I'll work 50 hours and I'll spend a million dollars and I'll solve it, right? I mean, you're lucky if you solve it. You're sometimes people spend years and they don't get that perfect product market fit. Mm -hmm. So it's right. just one of those, you know, I got higher order problems where like, how do I find love, right? Or how do I find mm -hmm. happiness or how do I find product market fit? And I think you've got to just be humble about it and keep your head down and keep going. Yeah. That's who you are. Sure. I think, you know, I had an interesting conversation yesterday with an entrepreneur. I were talking about the initial that he's going through. And, you know, we came, the conversation got a little bit, it turned to the fact that you cannot throw money at a problem. You know, if you're going through a problem in your startup or your, your, or your company, you know, another million dollars, another seed round, another raising is not going to help the solution it fix a problem if it's an internal problem that has to be worked on, you know, internally. So that's the same thing over here. Sir. Yeah, some problems you can, like you're scaling sales, you can't throw money at it, right? You're expanding to new regions, you know, you want to acquire more customers in a B2C company those problems you can solve through some money, right? But I think there's some problems inherently, again, product market fit, internal problems, you know, market wrong market, wrong product. I mean, those things you really can't solve with money. Correct, yeah. You know, one thing that does not get enough credit is the fact, you know, when you're starting a company and you're in a relationship, you know, the emotional um, strength or the, 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 I guess the, the, the strength and being in a relationship during that time um, is the most incredible thing. You know, when you're coming home at night, um, someone's there for you to console you, to help you, to take you through the hard times. Um, you know, talk, it seems like, I don't know if you were married during Pine Labs or not, or you were in a relationship. Um, talk to me about that, being in a relationship and definitely through Global Logic and everything to how the importance of it. No, I think, uh, uh, you know, I think certainly I agree with you. So I, so I was dating uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, my current wife uh, right when I was in college. Uh, and, um, and I think... Uh, 
uh, I remember in, we got married in 2001 again, so it was the same year. Uh, and uh, I, I, I'm sort of again, I'm sort of more forgetful about these things. Uh, mm-hmm. But I think uh, I know it was a big support at that time. I think during these particularly bad 2001, like I told you, my wife has kind of reminded me that you know she remembers me crying and all that. So I'm sure it was a big, big, big support. Uh, just to have a stable family, you know, the fact that sort of, you know, there's nothing, there's not another thing that you have to deal with uh, and all that. And over years, I think, um, you know, it allowed me to sort of just focus on work all through the 2000s and sort of I was never, you know, worried about something sort of really horrible going on back home and stuff like that. Um, so uh, I think it's definitely was a factor. Uh, and uh, over years, uh, you know, I can see now when I look back, and when I look at many other entrepreneurs as well, who maybe don't have that, let's say, right, or, mm-hmm. or they have a bad situation at home, right. it definitely accentuates, you know, every other problem that you have. So mm-hmm. I think, uh, you know, any, any kind of anchorage that you can, right? I mean, some people find that anchorage in something else, maybe in yoga in India these days, many people uh, do that just basic meditation. Uh, you know, I, I, some people find it in parents in India uh, or siblings or friends, you know, but any sort of support system that you have, which uh, which you value and which you know keeps you honest and keeps you grounded, I think is very valuable. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I definitely recommend people to sort of cultivate that more and more, whatever works for them. Right. You know, because start the journey, entrepreneurship journey is a lonely journey, and it's so emotional. So to have that support to be there for you during the good times and the bad times, especially the bad times, it's just so important. You know. Totally. So, you know, now your career brought you to, brought you to Leo um, Capital, right? Which is your investing firm. Um, you f- focus on C-stage investments. So, you know, let's go through the scenario. You know, and first of all, a startup comes to you. It says, hey, Rajul, we would love for Leo to invest in our startup. You know, what do you look for and what do you evaluate in a new startup? Sure. Yeah. So I'm, uh, so I sort of graduated from being an entrepreneur to being an angel a few years back. I was investing my own money for a few years. And then I set up Leo Capital, which is a VC fund. Uh, so it's a $30 million fund. Uh, and now I'm sort of investing from Leo. Um, so first of all, I think you just, I don't know if you know this, but there is a lot of entrepreneurial activity on the ground in India. Nice. So even a small fund, fund like us, I would say we get uh, something between 100 and 150 new uh, sort of pitches to us every month. Wow. Um, you know, so every day there's like six, seven new. Uh, and, uh, you know, so you have to sift through that. And, you know, I think obviously you reject a lot of them on email. Uh, you meet some of them, right? You do the first meetings and all that. But it's just a lot of activity just ground up uh, in terms of what you get today, right? Mm-hmm. But to answer your specific question, I think, uh, there's three three broad buckets I would say that uh, that we look for, and I I would sort of probably think most VCs look for those three things in their own way. I think the way of assessment might be different, uh, okay. but I think those three things. I think one everybody will tell you team, uh, right? And I think um, uh, for us, I think we have this a little bit of a thesis around founder market fit. Mm-hmm. We what we've seen is that certain kinds of founders are better fit for certain kinds of business. Uh, versus others which are better fit for other kinds of business. So I think we ask this question to ourselves of why these, this founding team will succeed in this business and try to sort of get some answers for ourselves. I think that's one that we look for. Um, the space itself is obviously very important. Uh, the, so the space is a combination of market size, right? Because as fund, we need to get into large, large markets and things like that. Timing. Um, you know, is it right to, I mean, you can't really do another Amazon today, right? As you know, it's just, that is gone, right? Mm -hmm. But you can be an online seller on Amazon, for example, in India. Um, You know, lending has been a new theme in India. Logistics is being reimagined in India. Uh, There's a lot of SaaS opportunities these days in India. So just from a timing perspective, why this business will succeed now? Why why does this business belong to today and to the next five years uh, versus let's say 10 years back or versus five years from now? Right. Right. So I think just the timing and sort of why invest in that business today is the, is the second thing. And third thing is just traction. So most businesses which pitch to us, I would say are one to two years old. Uh, they usually now angel funded. So we have something to look at. It could be, if it's an app, it could be just number of downloads and usage patterns and things like that. If it's a SaaS company, it could be a beta customer Mm -hmm. uh, or some pilot implementation, things like that. You know, so there's all something to look at in most cases. Uh, So sort of just peel the onion a little bit sort of, 
find those early signs of product market fit. Uh, I think that's the third one. So I think those are the three broad buckets, timing, founding team, uh, and I think uh, the traction that they have. Right. So what do you look for then in the, in the founder? You know, what are the characteristics that make up a founder that you like, hey, this guy could be going on to something? Right. So I think a number of things. Um, so first is just uh, the number of founders, right? It's harder to invest in single founder companies, even though we have done that in a couple of times. Uh, a couple of times it has worked out for us. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, generally, ideally, a two to three people founding team so that you just have management coverage. One of them ideally is more commercial, one of them is more technical, uh, you know, one is more operational. I mean, that's kind of the ideal team in many ways. Uh, the fact that they've been together and they kind of like each other, uh, because I think uh, I've seen cases, and I'm sure we all have, where founders have a fight between themselves uh, in the next couple of years, and that's like truly value destroying for everyone, very, very difficult divorces to deal with, uh, all these. Um, so I think uh, how far back they go, um, Ideally, if it's two, three founders, like a CEO within them, so there's a natural leader, uh, always helps, you know, in decision making and just propelling the company forward. Um, and then things like, um, uh, you know, are they fitment to the business? So for example, if it's a consumer business, app kind of business, you know, we've seen younger founders who are more technical, uh, mm -hmm. tend to do better, you know, they're coding quickly and churning out a lot of code, you know, iterating fast and things like that. Uh, if it's more of an enterprise business, um, you know, ideally, we would like founders who have sold globally. Uh, you know, enterprises work very differently, and it's hard for a 20 something to enter a JP Morgan Chase and sell anything. You know, so I think somebody who understands how to sell to a larger enterprise uh, and ideally has done that before. Um, so I think, I think those kind of things, if it's a lending business, ideally, we would want something, somebody who's like an MBA, let's say, right, who understands cost of capital and, you know, all those technical concepts right. around lending and has that level of conservativeness, uh, you know, around that space. Um, so I think those, those would be more specific things depending on the idea itself uh, right. that we've looked for in the point. Right. So it's a lot of matching up the idea together with the founder and the founder together with the idea and everything. I would say so. I mean, that's kind of, that's, that's important to us, I would say. Right. And I've, I've become a big parameter of success. Mm -hmm. So one of the things you talked about um, is saying that in order for a startup to have success, it has, the company has to build a defensible moat. Um, so first of all, for people that don't know, what is a moat and how can a company find their moat or build one out? Yeah, so a moat is, I mean, um, if you go back to sort of when the wars were happening, it's simply like the deep hole that you dig around your fort, mm -hmm. right? So I think imagine an enemy attacking your fort and what do you do to stop them? So if, if there's a big hole around your fort, then, you know, they're going to have to cross it right. uh, and you can use the time to kill them or sort of shoot at them or whatever, right? Uh, so I think that's kind of the original protection. What's the protection you have against enemy, uh, you know, in your business? And, um, you know, it's a, it's a really difficult question to answer early on in a business because many founders say, look, we're getting traction. We have customers today. We're doing well. You know, why are we being asked all these more questions? We'll figure it out. And there is some, some, I think there's some merit to that as well that you figure it out. But I think these days there are some businesses which have demonstrated that inherently those business, like social networks, for example, right? And they, the fact that, you know, it, it's only useful to you if all your friends are on it, you know, mm -hmm. becomes a moat. Let's say, imagine a new social network comes in tomorrow, then unless they have you and all your friends, it's not valuable to you. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's harder to get all of your friends together versus just getting you. I could incentivize you to come on my social network, but to incentivize you and now your entire network, right? It's just obviously a much tougher thing to do. Correct. Uh, and hence it just has that natural mode, what is now called the network effect. Uh, you know, all social networks have that. Uh, I mean, a case in point is even a company like Google has not been able to really challenge Facebook, you know, in spite of such a sort of such a valiant attempt because it's just very hard to break, you know, once you have these same reason by WhatsApp or WeChat, or sort of uh, Facebook Messenger now and all these, they're so hard to break because, you know, you just, you know, all my friends are on it. So I'm going to be on WhatsApp mm -hmm. and I'm going to be on Facebook Messenger and all that. Right. So I think, um, so I think that's, uh, that's one example. Um, you know, I think uh, data modes have become bigger and bigger. So these days, if you're in enterprise space and, um, you know, you have data, which only you have, right. And because of that, even if an enterprise shifts to some other vendor, they won't have that data because, you know, it was your data. Uh, you know, that becomes a mode. 
uh, and uh, and not just it not it's not just a factor that nobody else can replace you, but it also becomes a pricing determinator, right? So I mean, if you are valuable, you have that more, then you can have superior pricing. Uh, ultimately, you can be more profitable, right? You can spend more in sales uh, and all that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think uh, you know that's an example of a data mode. Uh, you know, so I think you have to look hard. I think of what those things are. I think the key is that as you scale, you know, is it does attacking you become more difficult or does become easier? Right. Um, like um, you know, if let's say if you're a services company, right, then it's just not very hard to attack you at any scale, right? Mm -hmm. Because it comes down to people. You know, I mean, there's no real differentiator, right? If I have, I could hire one person from Infosys or DCS or McKinsey, right? and go to the same client, then that client might still give me business because it's dependent on that person, right? right. Uh, but, uh, but imagine sort of, let's say if you're, you're an Apple user and now you have iCloud and you have iPhone and you have MacBook and you have all these things, it's really hard for you to replace any one of those, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you sort of, Apple has got you uh, with all these things and you right. can't really replace any one of them. Uh, you know, so that's the, so the, and those are some examples at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Now, and that was the most important thing for a company to have in order to get the traction like you need in order to make sure that they go ahead, you know, past their competitors and everything like that. Okay. You know, I, so, I, I think many of them, they just don't have any mode at all. Right. I mean, many of them sort of like, for example, let me g give an example of things which are not modes. like many startups think that because we're pricing it cheaper, that's a more, but right. really not because I think there's no systemic reason why they're pricing it cheaper. They've just chosen to price it cheaper because they're small and they don't care. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think as they grow, you know, the bigger competitor can always, you know, come down on price and sort of snuff you out. Or you may need to increase your price to sort of grow beyond a certain point. Right. You know, so I think that's an example, which is just not a mode. It's just more of a tactic uh, to gain early market share. Mm -hmm. you know? And that's just such a great example because, you know, obviously in the beginning, you need the traction. So you might have to lower your price, but eventually you want to go up and increase it and more and more and more. You know, and if your service is um, valuable enough, companies will pay for it much more. Exactly. So let's say a new entrepreneur comes to you and says, hey, Rajul, you know what? I'm debating. I want to start a startup. I'm not sure, this and that. What's your advice to him? So my, my advice always has been don't do it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Great advice. <laughs> I agree. I've had, I've had like, and it's a true story. I had a, I had a, sort of a uh, second cousin who had come to me three, four years back and exactly the same question. I told him don't do it. You know, and, uh, and he went ahead with it. It took another year sort of came back to me and said, hey, now I am an entrepreneur. And I, <laughs> I, I tried to help him. But look, it's not a decision you can take lightly. I think, um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of sex appeal. Sometimes people read all these stories, mm -hmm. you know, but the reality is that success is hard. It's hard work. Uh, statistically, your chances are pretty low, you know. So I think, um, you know, if you're not sure, just don't do it. Just defer it a little bit. You know, think about it more, meet more entrepreneurs, uh, you know, spend another six months to 12 months. It's not it's not, that option is not going to go away, right? I mean, you can right. always become an entrepreneur a year later. Um, so I think my, my, my standard wise, when in doubt, don't do it. You know, just kind of uh, wait a little longer and be sure that you really want to do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love how you say that. It's incredible. You know, especially like, you know, the sex appeal to it, you know, the, the founder porn, whatever you want to call it. It's just, um, you know, it's so overblown. People think, you know, I'm going to do it and hustle it out. No, no, they don't realize the bad days that go into so many bad days and in building a startup and you so looking back at your, you know, so far what you've done, what would you say are the important milestones um, that have made a difference or that pr brought things forward? I mean, right. Um, look, I think um, one is just the funding milestones, right? Especially in early stages. And, um, you know, I think we've heard sort of many people say that sort of funding is more of a, you know, it's not, it's an, it's, it's a means to an end. It's not the end mm -hmm. on its own, you know, but I think in early stages, it becomes an important determinator for market validation, your own confidence, your ability to hire people and things like that. So I think, and I, I see it with our companies today, you know, as they raise future rounds, you know, their sort of own confidence improves and they are more experimental uh, and all that. I think nothing succeeds like success. Right. right. And that, you know, in a private company, when you're small, uh, you know, just ability to raise money from top tier VCs, uh, becomes uh, becomes an important milestone, and I think it was for us as well. Um, so we 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 use uh, we raised money uh, in Global Logic from DFJ of Draper Atlantic uh, mm -hmm. in early 2000s, and then later on from Sequoia India uh, in 2006. They were important milestones. I think you know it sort of filled up filled us up with validation and sort of confidence to do more. 
uh, I think, uh, and throughout even today, I feel sort of with our companies today as they as they raise more funding, uh, I, I know it's important to them. Um, obviously, just as a fun time, first time entrepreneur, some exits are important as I exited Pine Labs, Globalogic, saw some liquidity for the time I come from sort of totally humble backgrounds. So I think, uh, you know, that just again, it's useful to sometimes again, get some chips off the table, you know, otherwise mm-hmm. sort of, you know, this family and this stuff that you want to do and it's more independence. So I think, uh, I think just seeing some real liquidity every now and then is, uh, is helpful. Uh, I think hiring key people is very, very key. I think it's an important milestone. Like in Global Logic, uh, we had the CEO, Peter Harrison, um, you know, and he, he was transformational for the company in those years. Uh, and I think a lot of credit of building out the company goes to him. Uh, mm-hmm. It was an absolutely key moment in the history of the company. I right. think the company would have gone very differently if he if he hadn't hired him or somebody like him. You know, uh, same goes for Pine Labs. I think Lokveer, his joining, the fact that sort of he worked at it for 15 years uh, and built the company was an absolutely key moment uh, for the company. Um, you know, so I think um, so I think those would be my top picks. I think external funding events, key people hiring, uh, sometimes even key customer acquisition. I would say right, like. For many startups, like you know, getting like a really solid one customer mm-hmm. uh, can sort of really be transformational uh, for the company. Let's say it's an enterprise company, uh, right. you know. So I think those are some of the key moments that I can think of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, looking, who are some people that have made a difference in your life? Professionally, I would say Peter, uh, the CEO that we had at Global Logic. So I, I actually worked for him for many years uh, because as founding team, sort of we all reported to him, uh, and I, I learned a lot of things uh, from him. He was a seasoned. Uh, professional by that time. Uh, he was already 15 years in the industry. Uh, and even today, you know, he's a, he's a very good friend of mine. He lives here in DC. And I, I stop by every now and then. So I think I think he was definitely a big influence on me and my management style, uh, discipline, and, uh, and a lot of other things that I learned. Um, I think uh, also, I think now, I think the best thing about being a VC or an investor of any kind is that you meet such exceptional people. Right. Uh, you know, many of the entrepreneurs that we work with are just truly exceptional. Entrepreneurs. I learn every time uh, I meet them, um, you know, so sometimes through their persistence, sometimes through their strategic choices, sometimes through their courage, sometimes through their technical abilities, you know, so I think um, many of them are mentors for me today uh, in different aspects, mm-hmm. uh, you know, so I think uh, so that is today like constant, I'm constantly learning uh, because of meeting them, yeah. uh, so, you know, it's a continuous process really. Now, I am just amazed <clears throat> by the amount of humility that you have. You know, it, it's incredible. And, you know, the ability, the fact that, you know, learning from, also learning from other people, you know, knowing that, you know, yes, I've done all this, but you know what, there's something to learn from every other person that I interact with. And, you know, can get something that enhance my life. And wow. Look, I think that's really key, you know, because I think, I think, I think the moment, I think the day you wake up and you think that I know, I think you're done. Pretty yeah. much, uh, I think I don't think anybody really knows. I think anybody, I don't think anybody has any answers. I think it's you figure it out every day and sort of keep going. One hundred percent. So, what message would you tell your younger self? You know, you come out of college, you have the whole world in front of you. You can do whatever you want. What would you tell yourself? <laughs> wow, well, look, I I've had it pretty good. I think uh, you know, I I I doubt I would do anything different or sort of anything sort of materially different. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy with my, with the decisions my younger self took and sort of, uh, how, how he dealt with life and sort of challenges that were thrown in front of him, um, and all that. I mean, there's sort of minor stuff obviously here and there that you can always do differently with the benefit of hindsight. But I think, uh, I think just being true to yourself and sort of following your instincts and sort of, I, I think not doubting yourself too much, mm-hmm. I think, and just kind of going with the flow a little bit. I think I've naturally been generally good at it, uh, but that's, I would, I would tell my younger self to just do more of the same, you right. know, sort of not, uh, not second guess too much and sort of, uh, you know, not overthink things uh, and all that. So I, I would sort of ask him to do more of the same really. Wow. Are your parents proud? I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, you know, like my dad was a government servant. His big dream was to sort of, for his kids to become government servants, government, run government jobs. And neither my brother nor I actually went that way. So I know he was disappointed for the first few years, but I think he's come around. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, Rajul, you know, I could talk with you for hours. You know, there's so many things that we haven't even touched upon yet. And there's so many lessons I'm sure that you could distill and teach us. I mean, there's so many things you could do. You know, if there's one important thing, it could be in hindsight in the future, that someone you think should implement in their life that can make them a better person, um, what would it be? I think uh, especially with sort of entrepreneurs and I think true with generally uh, with everyone, I think like I, I see many people who think that, you know, I'll achieve this and then I'll be happy or I'll do this, then I will do this, right? Or, uh, or this will happen, then that will happen. Yeah. I, I think I don't personally, I don't think it works that way. I, I, I don't think, I think, I think you can be happy today wherever you are and you, sh you should be joyous and happy and calm within yourself. Uh, I don't think we should sort of put our achievements, uh, you know, sort of as a precondition to our happiness. I think, you know, I think uh, especially with entrepreneurs, but I think in general with every, like I have kids, that's what I would tell them, you know, that find a way to sort of be, um, be joyous, be happy, uh, enjoy the work that you're doing, enjoy the process. Uh, and, you know, sometimes you'll be lucky and sort of results will come as well. Uh, and they will, you know, why will they not? I mean, sort of if you keep working at things. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that's what I would say. And I see sometimes people getting very perturbed about when things are not going well or sort of uh, or planning too much of just planning to be happy. You know what I'm saying? I think that's kind of, uh, I don't think that's a great place to be. I think, I think you should find a way to be happy today and sort of build everything on top of that. Right. A hundred percent. You know, there's a famous saying, who's a rich man? The man who is satisfied with what he has. Um, you know, that's a rich man. And, and I don't think it's dichotomous to being ambitious. You know, you can, I think that you can be very satisfied with what you have, but still be very ambitious, you mm -hmm. know, uh, hungry and sort of, uh, you know, aspiring for something. I don't think those are orthogonal necessarily to each other. Right. Um, you know, I think, I think you can be both. Yeah. And, you know, going to, to, to in, together for what you're saying is not, you know, li leaving your happiness to be dependent upon, you know, when I make a million dollars or when I build a startup or when I find the perfect wife, I'm going to be happy. When I find this ex, I'm going to be happy. Now, having that dependency on something that's outside your um, circle of influence of what you can actually change is leaving it up into the air. You know, it's like stepping in front of a train and saying, hey, you know what? Yeah. If there's a God in the world, I won't die. He'll save me. And if there is, so it's like. And, but, and the reality is you might find that when you actually did make the million dollars, it didn't really make you that happy. You know, maybe you felt okay. You may, maybe you felt happy for a few minutes and then you said, okay, now what? Right now, I'm going to make 10 million, right? I mean, exactly, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's never ending, right? I think, uh, so I don't think it's a precondition to anything. Right. Wow. Rajul. There's no way I could thank you. I want to thank you. I have learned so, so much out of this. Um, not just in, about entrepreneurship and startups and, and your own personal journey, but I've learned so many things that I can implement into my own personal life, my own career. And I'm sure many, many people are going to benefit from this too and hear about it. I mean, it's been absolutely phenomenal. We got to get you more often. You got to you know, start publicizing your story and teaching entrepreneurship courses to more people. Because there's so many things that people can learn from you. And I think it's, it's no, really, thank you so much. No, thank you. And thank you for reaching out. And I, I greatly enjoyed the conversation. And, um, you know, it was just lovely. So thank you very much. Thank you.